I want to echo what Henry said. This has been a wonderful experience and seeing old friends and making new friends and all the speakers have been incredible and the work that's done here is outstanding. And being the last talk, I've, there are a few people left. I think either Dr. Barros was saving the best for last or he assumed no one would be here anyway, so it wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be that important. So um, here we go. So I'm going to finish up uh, talking about total skin sparing mastectomy or nipple saving, uh, nipple skin saving mastectomy and what we've done uh, at the University of California, San Francisco um, and the results that we have over time. Obviously, as been shown earlier today that uh, breast surgery something like the radical mastectomy, which was horrific, to a little bit less with the modified radical mastectomy, but still uh, very difficult uh, for women to undergo, um, not only physically, but psychologically. Had some very interesting um, reconstruction efforts uh, with the tram reconstruction, utilizing the skin pedicle, and then having the plastic surgeon make a new nipple, and again, getting better and better over time. Um, and then finally, you can see here is nicely illustrated a woman that had a tram with an attempted reconstruction of the nipple and then unfortunately had a second breast cancer. And then on the left side, she ended up having the nipple sparing mastectomy. So here is very nice. You can see um, the differences between what we used to do and what we're doing now. It's that the total skin sparing mastectomy is the extension of skin sparing mastectomy, um, utilizing sharp excision and uh, nipple uh, dissection from inside, uh, preservation of the nipple areolar complex skin, um, and giving a much more uh, aesthetically appreciative uh, outcome. Um, not only is it important with regards to the aesthetics and the psychological and psychosocial issues, but uh, we also wanted to make sure that it was safe logically and that we weren't leaving behind breast tissue. And over the, over the last eight to ten years, we've met consistently to change how we do things, um, and we've, we've come up with some very nice um, ways of making it uh, successful. Now, the extension of this surgery is such that we really do a significant dissection behind the nipple. So this is not a subcutaneous mastectomy. We're actually going up inside the nipple and dissecting out all of the nipple tissue. And you can see that here on one of my cases where you can see um, as we invert the nipple and the areolar complex, you can see we really have taken down all of that tissue up inside the nipple and the nipple areolar or complex because we don't want to leave any tissue behind that might be um, dangerous in the future. Um, we look at oncological uh, aspects as well as ischemic complications um, over this time period as well. Um, we started the, the total skin sparing mastectomy back in 2005 and we've uh, followed how we've changed it over time. We've looked at the differences in nipple necrosis, skin necrosis, uh, infections requiring IV antibiotics. Unfortunately, there have been cases of implant loss with uh, immediate reconstruction. And of course, with regards to oncologic outcomes, we're looking at local recurrence rates um, and potentially distant recurrence, as well as how often the nipple itself is involved with the breast cancer. Here you can see what we've done over the course of time, starting originally with uh, these circumferential um, nipple uh, excisions and as well as nipple free, free nipple grafts, and then actually crossing the nipple itself directly through the nipple, uh, and then moving to what's more uh, uh, done much better, the inframammary incision um, and the mastop mastopexy is probably the most common that we use today. Uh, originally, this, the original cohort we call cohort zero, uh, mostly used free nipple graft as well as the crossing the nipple itself. Um, and this was from 2001 to 2005. Uh, and these incisions incorporated more than a third of the circumferential area of the, uh, of the nipple. And you can imagine a much higher risk of nipple necrosis. Uh, at that time, it was routine to have a preoperative MRI to try to confirm that the nipple was not involved. Uh, tumors that were less than two centimeters uh, for these patients, and they needed to be at least two centimeters away from the nipple areolar or complex, and of course, no skin involvement. So this was the initial um, way that we uh, would do the, the total skin sparing mastectomy. Again, we've done this through a quality improvement approach and looked at uh, different uh, aspects of this and changed it over time. So here you can see originally um, from 2005 um, to 2007 was the next cohort. Uh, here what we did is we changed our incision to less than a third 
of the nipple areolar um, incision along the circumferential areolar um, well. We decreased the use of routine preoperative MRI because we didn't think it was helping as much. Uh, we would perform it even if the tumor was within a centimeter of the nipple areolar complex, um, especially if the MRI did not demonstrate any nipple involvement. Uh, radiation therapy, if the patient needed radiation therapy, we were waiting um, originally three months after the surgery, um, and that would later change as well, and we were using a cephalosporin uh, for prophylaxis um, after the surgery. Uh, moving into the second time period, the plastic sturgeon started using the acellular dermal matrix, um, also known as alloderm, uh, for coverage of the tissue expanders. Uh, we decreased the use of immediate autologous re reconstruction. Uh, we found that we were having significant complications if we went with the total skin sparing mastectomy directly to the tram flap or the uh, deep um, uh, perforator flap, the free flap, uh, partially because of swelling and it put too much uh, pressure on the skin and we were having uh, nipple necrosis and skin necrosis. Uh, but you can see here uh, that was cohort two. In cohort three, we went back to being more selective uh, for tissue expander and use of the alloderm. Um, but we did find that what we wanted to do is for radiation post mastectomy, uh, we really moved that out um, to six months in terms of exchanging the, um, the, t the tissue, expander, tissue expander for the permanent implant, and that made a, a, a big difference as well. And then finally here in the fourth cohort, you can see that we started using, a plastic surgeon started using serratus fascia for coverage on the lateral aspect of the tissue expander and started moving away from using alloderm all the time um, and really changed uh, the type of patients that we were using. In fact, you can see here, if they were larger than a B cup, uh, we would not do any immediate reconstruction with autologous tissue, um, but would first place a tissue expander and then use the autologous tissue later on once the skin um, had healed. And then finally, the last cohort you can see here, um, we start using specific bio patch or uh, it's, a, it's a bio patch that goes around the JP drain to decrease the infection rate as well. And what you can see overall in our, our entire cohort, we have about 630 patients uh, with 981 total skin sparing mastectomies. The median age is 48. Follow up is three years now for this group. And you can see, um, some of the other uh, aspects of here with regards to chemotherapy, about 55% underwent chemotherapy, 36% uh, underwent neoadjuvant therapy, um, and we can see um, some of the uh, BMI issues. With regards to the total number that we do each year, as you can see, it's, it's increasing uh, the number of mastectomies, and that's obviously been shown uh, throughout the, uh, the, the United States itself. Here you can see uh, some of the characteristics with regards to stage. Uh, there have been some uh, groups in the United States saying that they only prefer to do this for early stage breast cancer, but you can see here uh, we've utilized it not only for stage one and DCIS, but also stage two and stage three and a few stage four patients. Um, here you can see with regards to uh, radiation, how often the patients were having this done with prior radiation. Um, initially we had a lot of problems at the beginning, and then now we feel comfortable doing it with patients that have prior radiation, and then of course post-mastectomy radiation hasn't changed much at all. Um, with regards to the preferred incision, um, you can see here uh, that originally we were doing these, um, these large uh, incisions here that were not very helpful, but we moved uh, to the uh, mastopexy, super areolar, and the inframammary uh, incision. And here you can see how that's changed here. So uh, the inframammary has really been the go-to uh, for us over the, the last um, eight years with the superior periareolar, uh, much more common in the last uh, few years as well, uh, significantly doing, for example, larger breast size and having that mastopexy or lift um, after the, the procedure. But the majority is the inframammary incision. Uh, with regards to immediate reconstruction, you can see here that uh, up front, early on, uh, we were doing a fair number of autologous reconstruction and also immediate implant, but we had a very high risk of uh, skin necrosis and nipple necrosis. Um, and you can see here the tissue expander, so the, the two-stage uh, implant uh, has increased significantly and it really dropped off after 2005, um, immediate autologous, uh, and we don't really do any immediate implant at this time. 
uh, because of that uh, problem with the skin necrosis and nipple necrosis. And here you can see how that changed. Initially, we had a fair amount of nipple necrosis and some skin flap necrosis. But since we've changed this uh, uh, immediate autologous uh, reconstruction and we've gone away from the immediate implant, the amount of nipple necrosis and skin flap necrosis has dropped uh, dramatically. The number of infections has dropped as well and implant loss has gone down uh, significantly as well. Here you can see with the autologous, uh, the nipple necrosis uh, is upwards of 18% if you do immediate autologous, whereas with the tissue expander, it's dropped dramatically to around 2%. Skin, ne skin necrosis has dropped significantly as well. You can see with uh, infections, with radiation, we do have a fairly high risk of an infection rate with previous radiation. Uh, and especially with implant loss of pa patients who've had uh, previous radiation, there's some significant issues here, uh, but it has uh, improved somewhat over the course of this time. Here, looking at the oncological aspects of this um, intraoperatively and postoperatively, uh, of the entire number of cases, what you can see is that uh, the nipple pathology, and again, we don't routinely do any kind of intraoperative assessment. These are all postoperative assessments. Um, but about a 2.5% risk of an invasive uh, tumor uh, cells found in the nipple and about two and a half percent risk of DCIS found in the nipple and you can see what we've done with that here 10 out of 17 had a nipple resection uh, five of those actually got radiation only and two of them had no treatment now these are not necessarily actual positive margins but they may be close margins or there are cells within that dissected out uh, retro areolar nipple tissue and so it just kind of depends on the patient situation uh, with regards to uh, nipple removal for these types of findings. Here you can see our um, outcomes with regards to local regional recurrence. Um, and if we uh, look at five-year, uh, overall recurrence is about 3% for local regional recurrence. Um, three local regional recurrences in the uh, DCIS population, but all of these were patients that have greater than 10 centimeters of DCIS that underwent uh, this procedure. But here you can see very good outcomes with regards uh, to risk of recurrence um, local regionally. Distant recurrence, um, about what you would expect uh, in general for populations, regardless of the total skin sparing mastectomy, um, a very low risk in these early stage patients and about 17% for stage three patients. With regards to survival, um, again, um, exactly what you would expect uh, for these stage uh, specific patients. So overall, um, we've been doing this now for, at least I've been doing it for eight years and the group has been doing it for upwards of 10 years. Um, the practice model is such that it's a team-based group practice. The surgeons, the radiation oncologists, as well as the plastic surgeons meet uh, twice a month to go over complications, uh, infection rates, uh, why potentially we've had nipple loss or skin loss, and really look at this and try to design and find out how we can improve it over time. I think that's a very good uh, uh, model uh, to be done in different settings. Uh, the complication rates have decreased significantly over time, especially moving from the uh, larger incision around the nipple uh, to the inframammary incision or this only one-third of the circumference of the nipple areolar complex. Uh, we have a very, very low risk of local regional recurrence, um, even with tumors that are within a centimeter of the nipple areolar complex. And overall, the distant metastasis rate is very low as well. I'd like to acknowledge uh, all the people in the group. Uh, Frederick Wang is a research resident uh, that uh, helped put this t together, as well as Dr. Pellet is also one of the research uh, residents. As uh, Henry mentioned, Shelley Wong had been there for numerous years, who is now at Duke. Um, my boss, Dr. Esserman, um, who's been perfecting this since she started it 10 years ago, and then our plastic surgeons, Dr. Foster, Dr. Spatani, and then the rest of the team as well. Um, so with that, uh, I thank you very much.